the House of Commons Commission, which is the panel mostly of MPs that runs the House corporately, has agreed to set up an inquiry. We don't know the terms of that quite yet. Is it going to name names and, and identify individual problematic MPs? The House has also committed something new, which is to basically rip up the existing HR policy for clerks and start again, which is something they weren't intending to do previously. Right. Now, Emily Commander, um, a case well known among the clerks. She's, uh, she alleges she was bullied by Paul Farrelly. He denies it. She's not spoken before. No, she's not spoken for one very important reason, which is that she's actually still a serving clerk. After the process, so she was alleged she was bullied by Paul Farrelly MP, she started a formal complaints process that rolled through. At the end of all of that, um, she uh, decided to leave the House of Commons. She was given a career break by the House, so she's, she's not working there day to day, but she is still formally a Deputy Principal Clerk of the House of Commons. So we asked her, first of all, why exactly it was that she chose to speak to us. For my whole career, I've been used to keeping quiet and sticking to the shadows, but when the Newsnight programme aired, my name became quite public in connection with bullying in the House of Commons. And because everybody knows that I exist now, um, I feel a duty to speak out on behalf of my colleagues who are still under the same professional obligations that I was under before. So can you tell us what happened to you when you were clerk on the Culture, Media and Sport Committee? So, being clerk of a committee, you have as a baseline duty to manage a team of people and you also have to help the chairman of the committee run their inquiries. And on this particular committee, there was a very high profile inquiry into phone hacking, which meant extremely long hours as a basic prerequisite of the job. And you were the clerk on the day that Rupert Murdoch got hit with a phone pie. Yes. You, actually, you are quite clearly visible in the footage. Yes. What are you saying on the phone? Um, you're taught to do only two things if something like that happens. Um, one of them is to remind the chairman to suspend the meeting and the other is to pick up the phone and tell the TV crews to cut the cameras. And that's what you were doing? So I was just telling them to turn off the cameras. So while well, running that committee you had an experience of bullying. Can you explain to us what effect that actually had on you personally? It undermined my confidence at a time when life was already quite stressful. So it made it difficult for me to believe myself capable of doing the job that I had been doing perfectly well up until that point. Um, and it wore me out um, and it made me feel profoundly ashamed. I, was, I found it difficult to admit even to my husband, um, let alone any of my colleagues, that I was having any difficulty because I saw it. And I think... Um, the person who did this to me saw it too as a sign of weakness for me to need to give in to it. I felt it to be my duty to keep going and I wanted to keep going because I loved my job and so I kept going and I kept going and at some point that, has a, that takes a toll on a person and they have to stop. And then you finally raised a complaint about what happened to you? I didn't really want to raise a complaint. What happened was that one day I started crying in my office and then went home. Um, my senior colleagues advised me to go home and I felt it wasn't sensible to be there with a staff team, with their manager in tears. And then it became clear to me that my job was in peril, not my job at the house, but my job on the committee, because if I wasn't there, I couldn't do it. Um, so at that point, I felt that I needed to explain what was happening to me and, and use the mechanism that was available to do that. I wanted what was happening to me to stop and I wanted to carry on doing my job and doing it as well as I could to the best of my abilities. And at that point, there wasn't a way for me to do that except to try to s stop the behaviour that I was experiencing. The complaint triggered an investigation by a senior member of House staff. He found there had been an abuse of power or position, unfair treatment and undermining a competent worker by constant criticism. The MP's conduct was deemed offensive and insulting. I expected that what would happen would be that the finding would go to the members' party and that they'd be asked to apologise and amend their behaviour and then everyone could get on with doing their jobs. Instead of which, the member appealed not only the finding but the process and the whole matter was referred to the House of Commons Commission. What did they decide to do? I don't think they really knew what to do and they wrote to me saying that they didn't know what to do with it. Um, so various solutions were tested out, um, including at one point it was suggested that the 
investigation should be reopened in some way and that the Commission should reach its own finding um, at one point that I should do mediation and eventually after several months um, I received a letter in private from the member concerned. Just a, uh, was it a fulsome apology? No, it's fair to say it wasn't. Do you regret making the complaint? I do really regret making the complaint. At the time I didn't feel that I had any other option because I was finding it difficult to carry on doing my job in the conditions that I was having to do it and I wanted to carry on doing my job and that was the only solution I could find but it was such a long and drawn out and painful process with so little to say for it at the end of it that I wish I hadn't done it. Well, I'd spent my whole career um, idealising the institution I worked for and thinking that the people above me in my management structure could do anything. Like they were superheroes, um, geeky ones, but superheroes. And then it made me, it was a, a profound moment of disillusionment to discover that for all their effort on my behalf and for all my effort, nobody was able to do anything even so simple as elicit an apology in the first instance, just a, a simple uh, apology and an attempt to set things back on the right track. Would you trust any system that leaves MPs in a critical role, either investigating or sanctioning other MPs on these issues? No, I wouldn't because of what happened to me before I made my complaint, I would have trusted MPs to remedy the situation quickly, discreetly, without unduly disturbing anybody. But seeing the months that it took with no resolution at the end, no. I think something that was an HR problem became political really quickly and it became about preserving a committee's reputation, preserving um, a party's reputation, ensuring a committee's findings weren't compromised. There were all sorts of political reasons why it was difficult to deal with. So what has to happen now? I think this is a great opportunity. Um, it's been really painful for me to have this dragged up again. But I think it having been dragged up, it's a great opportunity for the House to look at what it does and to create a new system that works well for members and is fair to members, but is also fair to staff and I think that the only way to do that is by having an independent system for adjudicating and resolving complaints. So the House of Commons Commission has just agreed to set up an inquiry. Do you think that's a valuable exercise? I don't see how you can set up any system without knowing what the problem is that the system's there to address. So unfortunately, painful though it might be for me and everybody else involved, I think they're going to have to look at past cases to understand the problem properly. And would that mean naming names at the end of it? Yes, um, I think they're going to have to name names. It doesn't necessarily have to be in public. And um, certainly for my part, I don't suggest for one moment that there needs to be any witch hunt. Um, but I think the Commission, at least, needs to know what it's facing. So you went through this very traumatic process. Mm. How do you feel now? Actually, I feel worse now, after all this time, than I thought I did when I first went on my career break. And that's because throughout my career, I've been trained to be resilient and fine. So when I made the complaint, colleagues would ask me all the time, how are you? And I would say, I'm fine, because that was a way of proving that I wasn't weak and sub submitting to being treated badly because I was a bit of a failure. But I was resilient and it's only now that I've been able to confront the fact that actually it wasn't fine at the time and it still doesn't feel fine now and that's been a painful process for me.